This is the Pixel 7a, the latest phone from Google, and I have to say it has really surprised me. Now, this budget-friendly phone is something that I was on the fence about picking up, and after using it for a couple of weeks, although it does have its warts, there is just something about this phone that makes me love it more than any other Android that I've tried recently. Today, I want to get into why I think this phone is one of, if not the best value Android phones on the market, and go over my whole experience with it over the last few weeks. So if you're curious about the Pixel 7a at all, and want to know the good and the bad that come along with it, stick around and let's get into it. Hey everyone, Kyle Erickson here. I've tried out a lot of mid-range phones on the channel before and tried out many more that I haven't even reviewed and almost always there's this feeling that there's some giant trade-off that you have to make to keep the price down. That usually comes in the form of build, camera, or display quality or just a general lack of features, but the Pixel 7a, in my opinion, makes the least amount of sacrifices that I've seen in a phone in this price range. The number one thing that I see on phones like this is a cheap plastic build, usually no waterproofing, and while the Pixel 7a does have a plastic gloss back. The housing is aluminum, it has an IP67 water and dustproof rating, and in general, it looks and feels like a premium phone. It's just a touch smaller than the Pixel 7 with a 6.1 inch screen and weighs in at 193 grams, so it's not the lightest in the world, but for someone like me who doesn't have huge hands, I actually really like the way that this feels. There's just something about the size of this phone and the general feel of it that I just really enjoy over most other phones. Maybe it's because the width feels similar to older Android phones and I'm nostalgic about it. I'm not sure it's hard to describe. From an aesthetic perspective it is a little bit plain in my opinion. The model that I have is charcoal in color and it does show fingerprints very easily. The front is fine but the back is a little bland and I'm more of a business in the front and party in the back kind of guy. Yes! I do like the raised bar on the back that is a little bit more functional than your standard camera bump in that you can rest your finger on it. I usually have my pinky finger propping up the phone at the bottom and this does take the pressure off there. A couple of things that I don't like, I'm not a huge fan of the button placement. I know I'll probably get used to this over time, but the volume controls are on the right side in the middle where the power is just above that. I would have liked if that was reversed because I do tend to use the power button a lot more for locking and unlocking my device and my thumb sits naturally where the volume control is. I just think it makes more sense to have the volume towards the top of the phone for those people who like using the physical buttons on their phone for photos where, again, it's a little bit more natural. There are stereo speakers along the top and the bottom of the phone. They're all right. I'd say average by most standards. They're just a touch on the quiet side versus a lot of other phones that I've tried, but are still good for casual use listening to music or watching content. We will get into the display in a second, but for those of you who are interested in a little better sound, this is a good place to talk about this week's sponsor, Soundcore. This is the Soundcore Motion X600, the world's first portable high fidelity Bluetooth speaker with Sky Channel spatial audio. If you've been around on the channel, you know how important quality is to me, and the Motion X600 definitely lives up to my expectations. The Motion X600 is ranked number one in DXO Mark's wireless speaker ratings, second in their volume measurements out of all the speakers they've tested, and is top three in spatial audio performance out of any wireless speaker. It's got a sleek, elegant look with a metal construction. There's illuminated buttons along the top with a handle just above those and USB-C and auxiliary inputs on the back. The finish on this is like a brushed matte look and it's got a really nice weight to it when you lift it up. Usually with portable speakers you're looking at a cheaper build probably made out of plastic with a generic look to it and this is anything but that. It's got a good balance of a minimalistic style with just the right amount of pop. I love that this could be more of an aesthetically pleasing accessory around the house versus just a regular black speaker. It's just so unique design-wise and the overall build quality is outstanding. The handle makes this really easy to take with you into any room in the house and it also has an IPX7 water resistance rating. So whether you've got this in a family room or you want to take it and sit it outside the shower and listen to it while you're in there, you don't have to worry about steam or a few sprinkles of water causing any issues. And it just adds to the overall versatility of the speaker. The model that I have here is lunar blue, but it also comes in polar gray and aurora green. And as impressive as the Motion X600 is on the outside, it's even more notable and exciting for what's on the inside. Under the speaker grill, there are two tweeters and two woofers. 
There's also one full range speaker in the top of the motion X600 that gives you three dimensional spatial sound with 50 watts total output. Again, that's something that's very hard to find in a portable speaker like this. To get started, it's super easy to set this up whether you're on Android or iOS. You just pair it up like you would any other Bluetooth device and download the Soundcore app and add your motion X600. Once you've got that connected, you can do things like adjust the volume, update your firmware and fully customize the EQ, whether that's using one of the pre-selected profiles or adjusting it yourself with a nine band manual adjustment. Regardless of what EQ setting you prefer, the sound that comes out of here is amazing. Soundcore has their own spatial algorithm in the Motion X600 and with both the upward firing speaker and the four speakers in the front, it creates an ultra wide soundscape versus a basic speaker that is only pushing out sound across a single plane. What that three dimensional sound does is make things a lot more full and immersive sounding. The sound fills out the room very well and regardless of the volume level, there is absolutely no distortion. Everything is crystal clear. The audio quality is very impressive and head and shoulders above your average speaker, regardless of what type of music or content you're listening to. The Soundcore Motion X600 comes in at $199, which is much cheaper than comparable speakers with this level of audio and build quality. If you're interested in the Soundcore Motion X600, you can check out the link in the description below. I've been using this speaker both for listening to music and for watching content on a couple of devices, and I'm honestly super impressed with it so far, which brings us back to the Pixel 7a to the screen. As I said, this does have a 6.1 inch display, so on the smaller side, but it doesn't feel like anything is too small or cramped. You might find that you have to turn up the font size depending on who you are because the text can be a little bit smaller on some apps and the keyboard can be hard to use if you've got bigger fingers or are used to a larger screen, but I find that I get the best results just using the swipe functionality. The display has a 1080 by 2400 resolution, so that combined with a bit of a smaller screen gives you 429 pixels per inch. It's a 20 to nine aspect ratio, and this is a 90 Hertz OLED panel, which I think is fantastic. Google doesn't directly advertise the brightness to the best of my knowledge, but from everything that is out there and confirming with my own tests, this is about a thousand its peak brightness. It's still plenty bright to view in direct sunlight, and I do really love the colors that come off of here as well. On a lot of OLED Android phones, I find that the colors can be a bit oversaturated, but these are just the right level of vibrance without it feeling overpowering. There's good overall sharpness, depth, and contrast, and I don't find there to be any issues with stuttering or jitter watching content or playing games. It might struggle a little bit with low light video, but outside of that, it's great. This does have a hole punch cutout for the front facing camera, which as someone who is used to using an iPhone 14 Pro isn't particularly noticeable comparatively, and under the screen is a fingerprint reader. I found the biometrics to work fairly well. The fingerprint reader is pretty average, not as good as some that I've used, but it's still gonna work most of the time with the occasional miss. The same can be said for face unlock. It works pretty much all the time in daylight, whether I'm wearing my glasses or my contacts, but can tend to struggle in lower light. That front facing camera is actually an upgrade over any of the previous Pixel models, including the Pixel 7 variants, with with a 13 megapixel sensor. I'm not one to use a front facing camera much, but if you're into taking selfies, this does a relatively good job. The depth of field effect works pretty well in portrait mode. Things are a little soft when you zoom in, but that should be expected with any phone camera. Moving to the lenses on the back, portrait mode does look a lot better there. You've got a main sensor, which is 64 megapixels and an ultra wide, which is also 13. The first things first, one thing that I immediately noticed on the Pixel was there's no shutter lag. The pictures are generally very sharp with little movement or motion blur, which isn't always the case on a lot of Android phones. On top of that, the main sensor can compete with even the best flagships, in my opinion, Everything is crisp and sharp and there's a lot of detail and texture. I think from what I noticed, the image processing does tend to increase the clarity and texture a little bit. Outside that, the colors are very accurate and they don't appear to be blown out or too saturated and stay fairly consistent between the main sensor and the ultra wide. That ultra wide also takes great images. There's of course gonna be some distortion given that this is an ultra wide lens, but it does remain sharper around the edges than a lot of ultra wides where you start to see some detail and texture fade out. Now, while this camera system does have more megapixels than the Pixel 7 and the Pixel 7 Pro, the sensors themselves are smaller, which means that the 7a isn't great for night photos. In night mode, I've experienced mixed results. I do find it works a lot better if you're outside taking pictures of buildings or something of that nature, 
but indoors it loses a lot of detail compared to some of the other phones that I've tried. This is also where you can tend to notice a little bit more color shift at times and switching to video in low light can result in quite a bit of noise or softness. When it's light out, video quality is solid. There's solid autofocus and tracking on the main sensor where you can shoot both in 4K 30 frames per second or 4K 60. The image is great and weirdly the one thing that I'm the most impressed with is in the sun there's virtually no lens flaring at all which is really rare because most phones these days use a hardened glass or crystal material over the lens and often have metallic rings around them. You can tend to get quite a bit of flare fairly easily but it's almost non-existent on the Pixel 7a. Another thing that plagues a lot of phones in this price range is you'll get this weird pulsing effect at night from the stabilization. Again, the 7a is a lot more effective at minimizing that. Just speaking to stabilization, the main sensor does have optical stabilization and has a few different styles offered in the camera app. There's standard stabilization, which is just the default, locked and active, which I don't really use, and cinematic pan, which can be kind of handy sometimes, but for the most part, I find that I don't really use anything beyond the default. The one thing that you need to be careful of when you are recording video, especially in 4K 60, is the phone will warm up quite a bit and suck back the battery. So if you're planning on using this a lot during the day to take video, it's worth making sure that your battery is fully charged. There are some more notable features with this camera enabled through software. I'm sure a lot of folks are familiar with like Magic Eraser. That feature works relatively well. I find that with outdoor scenes, it can be good depending on what you're looking at, but I'd say about half the time it makes more of a mess of things than making it look better if you're looking at the details. Still, that's a pretty neat feature. And just in terms of the software in and outside of the camera functionality, I've been really impressed. The Pixel 7a runs Android 13, and this is honestly one of, if not the best Android phones that I've tried in terms of just how smooth everything feels. Part of that is definitely affected by the 90 hertz refresh rate, which by the way, isn't on by default and you will have to turn that on in the settings. But just in general, the small details like the lock screen animations and transitions make this feel super smooth. This has the Tensor G2, which although it's not as performant as some of the higher end Snapdragon or Apple Bionic chips is still more than capable. There's eight gigs of RAM and 128 gigs of storage and everything has felt very snappy on anything that I've done on here, whether that's been gaming, recording video, editing photos, or just doom scrolling on social media. Just like with recording 4K video for an extended period of time, the phone can tend to warm up if you're gaming or pushing the chipset at all. If you run any kind of benchmarks, you will notice it throttle, but in real world use, this is going to be able to handle anything that you throw at it for the most part. Now, like I said, if you are recording 4K video or you're gaming a ton, this is likely going to eat through your battery a lot faster. I know a lot of people have complained about the battery on the Pixel 7a, but honestly, I think it's fine. It's not going to break any records for usage per charge, but I found it to be good for eight to eight and a half hours on a single charge with light to regular usage. This is only a 4,385 milliamp hour battery, so it's not huge, but I think eight hours of screen time is pretty decent for that size. This has wireless charging, which is something that you don't often get in budget phones, although it is painstakingly slow. It only supports 7.5 watts for wireless and I found it to charge at about 18% an hour, which is still probably all right if you're leaving it overnight, but not something that you'd particularly want to use if you're looking for a quick top up. Wired charging through USB-C is good for up to 18 watts and that charges much faster. You can get a full charge if you're running on empty in around an hour and a half. It's still not as good as some phones I know, but relatively acceptable. One thing that I found that I got a lot of mixed results on was wireless connectivity. This is supposed to support Bluetooth 5.3 and Wi-Fi. 6e. Bluetooth has been fantastic and I like that when I go to pair up my Nothing Ear 2s. I don't even have to do anything on the phone. It just recognizes that these are in pairing mode, connects them up, and also gives me the option to download the companion app from the Play Store. Not only that, but I found the Bluetooth range to be outstanding, better than most phones that I've tried, and in a general sense, anything that I've paired up to these, whether that's earbuds or the Soundcore Motion X600, have been very solid with no visible lag or latency. Where things have kind of been disappointing is with Wi-Fi 6e. I don't know what's going on with a lot of these manufacturers, if they just can't figure out stable connections on Wi-Fi 6e or what, but regardless of the type of router or mesh system that I use, I have a lot of products that don't seem to want to connect to the 6 gigahertz band. What makes this even weirder is that my current mesh system is Google branded, so you'd think that the Pixel 7a would be pretty good at dealing with it, but I just 
can't get this thing out of Wi-Fi 6 and onto 6E, which is unfortunate because every other device on 6E is way faster. It's still pretty quick on regular Wi-Fi 6 and the range is pretty solid as well. It's just a little bit of a letdown. I know there are a few misses with this phone in a couple different areas, but when you look at this price for around $500 USD, it's really tough to beat in my opinion. You get most of the bells and whistles that you normally get with flagships, even though they aren't quite on the same level. And I don't know, there's just something about this phone that maybe it's a price and that it just has a bunch of premium features with a few imperfections here and there that make me really love it. I think I'll be keeping this as my main Android device alongside my iPhone 14 Pro, but I'd love to know what everyone else thinks of the 7A. Uh, folks seem to either love this or hate it. So it's just interesting to hear different perspectives, but it's hard to argue with that price. That's it for me today. I hope you found this video entertaining or useful. If you did, feel free to electronically select that like button. If you'd like to see more tech related content or freestyle rap battle each other to classical music, please subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next upload.